Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Joe Massey. Joe is a robotics engineer with a background in a bunch of industries, including consumer robotics and entertainment. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's nice to be here, Spencer. Good to have you. Uh, we had a good conversation at work the other day, and I thought uh, this would be a fun motherfucker to get on the podcast. So I'm grateful you took me up on it. Well, hopefully this will all be interesting to you. Yeah, for sure. So the first thing I want to ask about is that uh, that droid over your shoulder, because we kind of talked about Mike Senna the last time we talked, and, and he seems to be kind of like a staple of that community making Star Wars droids. And also, I don't know which one that is from the movies. So I, I guess I, I okay. got a bunch of questions. So he's a derivative of R2 called R7. Nice. Um, I'm not sure where he fits into the Star Wars uh, environment, but I built him because he's just a little bit different than the ones that everybody else has when you see at conventions and everything else. Um, his target was is to be my uh, office droid at Disney. Nice. He never quite made it there, and uh, when the uh, pandemic came, Disney shut everything down and... Uh, proceeded to let go a huge chunk of Imagineering. Ah, it sucks. It was it it was really a, a, a sad day when I, when my career there was over. Brutal. Although I'm talking to him again, and uh, we'll see what happens. Cool. What kind of stuff did you get to work on there, obviously, that you can talk about? So uh, everybody knows, of every, or a lot of people have seen the flying robot that we did for the Spider-Man attraction in California Adventure. And uh, my uh, part of that was I wrote, rewrote the software that's on him. Um, the original project was done by a PhD and a couple of contractors, <laughs> and the code was kind of cobbled together on a couple of different processors. And uh, I worked with a hardware engineer. We designed a very low cost board to live inside him, and I wrote the software for it. Nice. I saw a video of that thing crashing into a building that looked like a settlement because it collapsed right away when the Spider-Man hit it. Was that, I'm guessing that was the first iteration or was that, how um, did that go no, down? No, that actually would have been the one in the park. Um, the testing that we did, we just had in, in a setup built with a bunch of trussing and a bunch of big catch nets. Um, now there's two different videos of him crashing. There's oh. one where he crashes into the wall and slides, kind of slides down the wall. And that one is actually a fake. Um, the wall that's there is a breakaway wall um, because um, I actually talked to the guys that uh, are still involved with him. And what happened is we actually had a winch fault failure and we launched him with a very powerful winch. Um, and it had a fault failure and uh, the robot never was instructed to actually go do his, his routine. Oh, that makes sense. And it really just crashed into the wall. And uh, um, I'm sure it broke some of the plastic shells on it, but he's an aluminum frame with 3D printed parts on him. And uh, they actually have the print files in the park, and they have 3D printers in the park, and they can make new parts for him. Nice. So that was probably pretty quick to get up and running again after that happened, and it failed as safely as it could, it sounds like. I mean... Yeah, these things um, there's actually four of those robots. Nice. So they uh, they keep two in on the on the roof of the building where they do the attraction, and then they t keep two in a maintenance building behind backstage area. So those two are hot spares for the ones that are on the roof, and then yeah. the ones on the roof are designed to just increase cycle time by virtue of there being two of them. Decrease well, we rotate. Time. They rotate them. They rotate them fairly regularly because they do get quite a bit, a bit of abuse landing. <laughs> um, it's a 12 g acceleration to launch Holy him, moly. and uh, so they well, have to geez. dissipate. They have to dissipate roughly the same amount of energy. That's insane. Um, the catch net system was done by somebody who does most of the catch nets for Cirque du Soleil. Nice. Um, so it's it's a gradual deceleration tool, and probably like designed for humans if they're doing Cirque du Soleil as well. He that's what he normally builds for is that is the guy that designed it and so uh, and built the system. Um, so it uh, it it allows a little less damage to the robot when it falls. 
Um, the <laughs> way I don't know any humans that are accelerating at 12 G. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah. No, that's why when uh, people were talking about Disney faking that whole thing when we were doing the development of it and everything, we just kind of laughed at everybody that was talking about, oh, it's faked. It's somebody in a suit or something like that because there's no way somebody could do that. And not pass out. I mean, like there's so yeah, many we'd reasons. rip their arms off. Yep. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons not to. <laughs> that is um, wild. Um, what was it like? Like, what was the timeline on that project? I guess, what was it like working on it? How do you get pulled we, in? Um, so I got pulled in because I had done a short contract at Disney before that working on software for some of the animatronics. Um, and, uh, then uh, when they were looking for somebody, they uh, a bunch of the people there recommended me to them. And uh, fun story, I go into the interview with the the two people who are the head of that project, and one of them is the he's the creative director, and the other is the technical lead. And the technical lead has a PhD from Harvard. And I had done a little bit of research on the people that I was going to be talking to, and for some reason. We're five minutes from the end of the interview with them, and I go, "Well, I see you got a uh, your your uh, PhD from Yale." <laughs> they love that. And the creative director go, looks at me and he goes, "So close! Five minutes from the end of the interview, and you had the job up to there to that point." Oh no! <laughs> but they still hired and you. The other guy's just laughing, and I'm going, "Oh God, I got it wrong. It's it's Harvard. I I just looked this up." And uh, that became a joke for a while, too. How do you know if somebody went to Harvard? Um, uh, you look up their uh, LinkedIn profile. I was going to say they tell you in the first five minutes of talking to them. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> well, so Bad joke. The, the guy who was the head of that project, Morgan, um, the technical lead, you would never know was a Ph.D. in talking to him. Yeah. Um, he was one of the easiest going guys I have ever worked with. That's cool. The team was, the team was a bunch of nutcases. Okay. Um, they, uh, the, the project manager was a, um, theater arts major and, uh, we would have team meetings where somebody would make a reference to a television show or a movie or something. And we'd have to stop the meeting to make sure that everybody gets to see the clip that this was from so that we all were on the same page, you know? That's pretty funny. Um, we finally gave in in one of the groups I'm working in now and created a water cooler tab in our Microsoft OneNotes just for all the movie recommendations we've been throwing back and forth. Because otherwise it sort of derails the meeting because you, you want to remember it and everybody tries to get out their notes and jot it down. So this way it's like, nah, just goes in OneNote. You look it up later. I just downloaded Atomic Blonde, Fountainhead, and um, the original Dune from the 80s from that list. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Well, we had to stop in one meeting and watch a clip from Cop Rock. What is Cop Rock? It was a one season long television show where it was a police drama that every, every few minutes people broke out into song. <laughs> so it's like High School Musical, but like in the uh, form was, of was... like Starsky and Hutch, I'm picturing. Yeah, something like that. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I had never seen it before, so we had to stop and watch it. Have you heard of Samurai Cop? No, I haven't. That's It's like become internet famous for being campy. It's like a um, just a poorly directed movie um, with a guy that is not wearing a shirt for most of the movie <laughs> and carries around a katana and he goes around fighting crime and... Um, because and he's a white guy and he goes by Samurai Cop. <laughs> so, I'll have to I'll have to find that one. Yeah, there's some good clips. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Red Letter Media reviews, but they they do a pretty good job. They interview the guy. So oh, I'll have to find it. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I'd be curious to know what you end up thinking. <laughs> but it's in a similar in a similar van. I'll have to watch Cop Rock. So I'm I'm looking forward to that one. So. Um, how did you get into building Star Wars droids? Because that's like, that's not a usual hobby. I hate to break it to you, but I, I don't, I know you and Mike Senna of the people that do that in, in my. Yeah. So, um, in my group, I spent like nine years at Intel 
and doing net high speed networking. Um, cool. And uh, they announced they were closing our building um, because they were closing small sites. And uh, I decided I needed to find something to do during that time while I'm thinking about where I'm going to go next to kind of, you know, just to keep myself busy. It makes sense. Been there. Um, kind of a stress release and stuff like that. And I found, uh, I found a YouTube, uh, uh, not YouTube. Um, uh, I, I found the plans for this thing on Thingiverse. Nice. And uh, researched the guy that was doing it, and it turned out he was actually doing a newer generation model than the first one that he had. Did you and find it as R seven or as R two? And, and make... R two. Okay. I also have an R two right over That's here. That's cool. He's right next to me, and there's a dome for R two hanging up on the wall. And nice. In another room, I have a metal R two dome. These 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 guys are three D printed. How'd you get a metal one? Did you machine that or? Um, the dome, um, there is a small group of people who make the, the serious R2 builders like Mike Senna, who um, various people have taken on various parts of R2 and sell them. They're allowed to sell them as part of the R2-D2 sanctioned builders group so that Disney's sanctioned like signed Lucas off Films. That. Yeah, okay. Lucas Films is, is, is aware of that group and has kind of provided them guidelines and they can make parts, but they can't make it a business. Oh, interesting. You can't go make money full time on it. But there is a guy here in Southern California that has an arrangement with a company back in the Midwest that does pressure formed aluminum domes. Interesting. That's not a process I really know about. Um, basically, you have a, a mold that's been machined yeah. and you lay a piece of metal over it and you use a hy rubber hydraulic press to press into the mold, the, the hydraulically form the uh, shape. What kind of tonnage are you pressing with in order to, or do you I have, have no idea. I have no idea. I, I, I know the process because decades and decades ago, I worked in a photo etching shop and we use that to make, um, uh, little metal panels we were making up for ion thrusters. Oh, interesting! Like real life ones. Real life ones, awesome. and we were using we were using hydraulic forming for them um, because we would have to put. It's got to be a lot of pressure to to work the way you're describing. Like that's. I mean, it's it's got to be significant. Yeah. But it uses a rubber membrane to to actually do the form to to use the shaping with so that it can form any kind of curve that you put a uh, tooling under it for. That's interesting. I'm, I might go on a, like a Wikipedia rabbit hole on that or start calling up friends in manufacturing tonight. That's uh, that sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. But so, so I have they... a metal dome, a metal dome for it from one, one, a guy who does that. That's awesome. And, uh, so, I'm looking at getting other parts to build a, a non 3D printed one. It'll be probably uh, plywood and uh, aluminum. Nice. That sounds like fun. But I, I picked this whole thing up because I was looking for something to do to keep my sanity while I watched my job run out, my job time run out. I, I had a bad breakup when I was in grad school and, um, or right out of grad school, and I, I took up battle bots as a hobby around then, and I, I maybe spent fifteen hundred hours in a machine shop working on one to kind of take my mind off it. So I, uh -huh. I feel you. Same idea. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You're like, I'll never make a dime on this, but at least it'll distract me from my sorrows. <laughs> so, actually, right behind me now, I've got a three D printer running, doing another part for the motor drives in the uh, feet of the R2 that I have over next to me. How do you 3D print a part of the motor drives? Is that like a mount? Um, it's the uh, actually the the wheels I'm printing oh, right cool. now. OK, that's awesome. Um, you, are they uh, rubberized at hard... all? What's that? You were about to tell me. I cut you off like an asshole. <laughs> no, don't. Um, so we print the, the hubs for the wheels, and then we do uh, out of normal, I use um, um, pet G nice. plastic. And uh, then we use a flexible rubber to do the tread on it. 
like a TPU or like a Plasti Dip type thing. I use a TPU. And you print that around. So you're doing a bimaterial print? No, I print them separate and then put the hubs together. Oh, sweet. Kind of like a split rim. That's awesome. Did so, you design that or is that like a Thingiverse find? Um, the group that I build the 3D printed droids out of is an amazing group. There are like seven or eight guys on there that are just CAD gurus. Um, the guy who does the original work for most all of it is just amazing. That's awesome. Um, his, na his name is Mike Badley, and he's in England somewhere. It's a cool name, and too. I, I Badley was... is a great last name. I wish I had that. <laughs> but I did get the chance to meet him at Star Wars Celebration in Anaheim um, earlier, th uh, earlier this year. Nice. Last year. And uh, there's the cool thing really... about hobbies like that. Like, I feel like when I was in the battle bots, like you could meet all the people from the TV show really, really easily. Like it was, it was a super accessible group. It seems like a similar vibe. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, these guys make designs and then they go, Oh, well here it is for everybody to use. Yep. Um, I'm not that just, altruistic just, anymore. <laughs> just, just the caveat is it can only be given to people in within the group. Do not share it outside the group because the group has the rules that link that Lucasfilms has put in place. Oh, so if it gets shared outside and somebody commercializes it, say in a place where it's difficult for Lucasfilms to cat, uh, patent and force or something, then that's where you get but, in trouble because you know all of a sudden people are trying to sell you know something that Lucasfilms wants the uh, IP to. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and Lucasfilms has gone after some people doing different parts of this. Well, what I'm wondering is how the aluminum dome guy escapes that because it seems like that's a business. But um, actually, he only does a handful of them at a time, and he sells them basically just above his cost. Oh, that makes sense. So it's like small enough they don't care, and it's right good for the and community. There's, so. And it's like the other people that build this stuff too. They don't do it for a living. Yeah. It's just a side business. Yeah. Well, and I can certainly respect anybody wanting to cover their costs and even make a little money, you know, doing what they're doing. I mean, I think probably where Lucasfilms, like, would take exception, I guess, is if you were selling directly into the fan market, you know, to non-builders because that cannibalizes their merchandising. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's the same with the cosplay groups. It's the same with... The uh, you know the people making star star tr stormtrooper armor yeah and, well and I've all of I've that. seen people doing that that have like gotten deals with Disney you know where I mean they've paid them for a bunch of that stuff I mean I'm sure that there's people in the droid bunny community that are making props for the movies at this point and on the um, that would be Mike Senna is one of them nice um, uh, the other is Mike McMasters which he and Mike Senna are really close friends. So in order to make it in this community, your name has to be Mike, is what I'm hearing. That may be why I haven't made it anywhere <laughs> in the community. <laughs> Similar to Mikey Mouse. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Bit of a stretch. I'm just I'm just kind of messing around. But that's cool. Um so what are some of the other things you've worked on that you're particularly proud of or that, that might be interesting to, to a guy like me? So uh, launching sometime this summer will be the Psyche Space Probe. Oh, nice. Um, it, launches, it launches on a Falcon Heavy. Um, it's going out to a piece of, they believe it's an iron core that is the um, possibly a planetary core. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, I did some of the software work on it. Um, Is that like an asteroid? I, yeah, and it's out in the it's out near the Kuiper Belt, so it's I guess it's fairly large. Um, but uh, so you're they, doing uh, like a mining operation, or is it more just exploratory, or what's the what's the deal? This is just going to be a flyby. We have a whole bunch of sensors on the Psyche spacecraft, uh, you know, magnetometers and uh, infrared equipment, and uh, they're going to fly by it for they're going to fly around it for like six or nine months. Nice and collect data on it. So that's cool. 
Why six or nine months? Just because that was like a service life that's hittable or because that's how long it's going to be proximate to the earth and you can send data or like... Um, no, it should be, it's, it's not far enough away that we can't send data back continuously. I think six or nine months is the uh, fuel capacity that they have for makes how sense. long they can stay on orbit. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess with an asteroid, like you can't just get in orbit the way you can with a planet because it's small enough that gravity won't do the work for you. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That's interesting. I, I was an intern at SpaceX like way back in 2013, and I remember we had like Falcon Heavy t-shirts, but I don't think we'd launched one yet at that point. <laughs> so it's neat oh, to God. know that that's actually doing its thing now. I, um, admittedly, yeah. I've kind of tuned out a bit since I stopped working there, but I, I always get happy yeah, when I hear the news because it's, it's really cool stuff and it's advanced in the field. Yeah, they've got a heavy rolling out to the pad for a launch possibly this weekend. Is that, have they been launching them for a while then? Or is this like, are they just this starting will, to launch them? I think this is number four or five Falcon Heavy launch. Nice. That's um, awesome. They did uh, 61 Falcon launches last year. That's wild. Including, I think, one or two heavies. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I know the plan when I was there was to land the individual, like the side rockets. Is that's are they actually doing that now? Yeah, there, <laughs> there's some awesome vi there's some awesome videos of the two of them coming down side by side. That's awesome. That's just showing off. It's it it's that in itself is impressive. I of mean, course. yes, it's impressive that they get that much weight up in the it's space. It's a really difficult else. controls problem too, because apparently your center of mass is changing on something like that with your fuel consumption. Yeah. So, I mean, I respect the hell out of anyone that worked on that landing problem. And I mean, they cracked it a while ago at a base level, I guess, but it still boggles the mind. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, landing on the drone ship is, you know, it's like trying to land on a postage stamp in the middle of a swimming pool. So, that's, you know, <laughs> that's moving, pitching yeah. and rolling. And yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I have a lot of respect for those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. We got approached uh, at the company I work for now about building a, a vertical landing system for rockets and I called up some of the guys I worked with at SpaceX years ago just to be like that were on that team just to be like, hey, what would it take to do this? And they were like, they were like, there's a reason it took them as many resources as it did to crack that one. I'm like, ah, I see. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's the nice video I think SpaceX put out that's the how not to land an orbital booster. I didn't see that one yet. Can you give me the close notes? Um, it was out years ago. Um, it's basically all the failures. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that'll happen, right? When you're doing something yeah. that you've never done before and that's never been tried. And, you know, in their case, it's good advertising. You might as well tell people, see, we failed. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to spend well, tens we'll of millions it. of dollars trying to catch up with us? Yeah. <laughs> see how hard it was for us? Good luck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. So, um, what was your role in that one? Like, how'd you, how'd you get involved? What kind of subsystems did you work on? Um... So every spacecraft that NASA flies has a back door in it. Um, and like when you hear they're working to recover the Hubble, they're using the back door because something is corrupted in their software system and they need to figure out what it is and either reprogram it or whatever. And uh, so my job was is to write a piece of software that can go in and read and write memory anywhere in the system. Oh, that's interesting. Um, because every now and then, you know, you, you cosmic radiation hits a bit in, in memory and changes it. And now you're stuck in some mode that you don't want to be in. What happens if your software um, gets hit? Then it's screwed. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you're not going to recover from. <laughs> Brutal. But uh, yeah, so my my prop my job was is to create the environment to allow them to update memory, read and write that. You know, because what they'll do is they'll read all the memory back and then they'll run it in their local you know copy of the spacecraft and say, okay, now it's doing this. Why is it doing that? What do we need to change? 
and then they'll send the instructions back up to the spacecraft to fix what needs to be fixed. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, they they never send the uh, Mars rovers off on a uh, on, on an ex expedition until they've actually run it in their simulators and possibly on the uh, duplicates that they have here on Earth. Yeah, um, makes a lot of sense. You, you always test the instructions before you send them to a craft like that because it, it, if you end up in an unrecoverable position, you're out millions. And there's no millions. way. Yeah, you just you just have a dead asset. Yeah, it's not like you can send AAA out to tow it out of a hole you just drove it in. On a much lower stakes note, I got to drive a three-quarter of a million dollar robot earlier today. <laughs> And that Very was pretty cool. fun. Yeah. I, I was visiting a client's site and they had it out because we were doing work on it. And I just thought to myself, I'm like, I'll probably never get another chance. Can I drive that? And they were like, yeah, yeah, knock yourself out. <laughs> and the guy handed me the pendant and I was so careful <laughs> to, to just, you know, like. One, yeah. One of the companies I talked to was uh, they're working on developing and actually i guess they've already deployed some um mining robots oh cool i, I actually worked on I'm, that like years ago i worked for, for joy global on mining robots uh, and and i'm talking to them and they're going um do you mind being around big heavy equipment and i'm going no that doesn't bother me any he says do you mind being in a mine you know a couple of miles underground uh and i'm going uh, i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> funny he says yeah we get that often yeah it makes a lot of sense yeah um i enjoyed it but i i always worked from the lab so i was always working on uh we had a 12th scale miniatures program and we would build out um algorithms and control systems on those first and test them uh -huh. that way and then someone else would take them out in the field and run them on the vehicles i wasn't there very long so I was I was only there about six months, and um, I got to build um, stuff that should never have been built the way it was. Like so, we we had for our compute on this. Uh, it was a surface vehicle that did drilling of blast holes to inject some tech explosives into, um, and it would go around a surface mine GPS uh, with RTK guided, and and just drill these things out in a grid pattern. And I wrote the um, navigation software, but I wrote it for a PLC, like a National Instruments PLC in LabVIEW. And uh -huh. not my, it wouldn't have been my design choice, but yeah. that's what they told me to do. So I did it. <laughs> so it worked. <laughs> this was, wasn't easy. Yeah. Um, I think they know about the NVIDIA boards in that lab now. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, we were talking earlier before we started this about uh, my current position, which is rogue aerospace or rogue space systems. Nice. And uh, well, it was, but their uh, funding um, ran short. Oh, Jesus, man. I'm one so their sorry. Investors, one of their investors backed off. And since I was working on the autonomy part of it, and they currently have just enough autonomy to get by with what they're doing for their first flights. Um, Sure. Sorry. I didn't mean to... They uh, they uh, decided that uh, they uh, are going to have to put me on hold for the time being. That sucks. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, I've I've had a couple of discussions recently with some other companies, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think you know it's it's interesting because when you do the sorts of things that like someone like you or I can do, I mean, you tend to rack up kind of a high salary, and then when times get tough financially, I mean. You know, that's that's what you want to cut as a company. <laughs> so it's an interesting catch twenty two, right? I mean, I don't know. Well, I have I have a lot of years in the embedded space in general, um, and uh, so that does help a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did a lot of embedded Linux with uh, Intel for our networking chips that we built there. Nice. We built uh, ten. Um, 40 and 100 gig Ethernet switches. That's awesome. You know, um, a 72 port 10 gig Ethernet switch with chip was one of the products that we built. 
and uh, I worked the on the. For that? I did the API for it. Nice. Uh, Not easy to do. Did. did you start at the architecture level, or did you just go straight to implementation? Um, when I got the the company, we had done a twenty four port, um, basically hub. We hadn't done the router yet, and they had started an API for that already. And so what we ended up doing at that point was continually just adding pieces for all of the new functionality that each chip provided as we went along. That's cool. And uh, our API was set up in such a way that uh, when it figured out what chips were attached to it, it would instantiate that particular chip. And it gave you the exact same interface, to, regardless of what chip was there. When you tried to tell the switch chip to add a route, it would tell you, obviously, we can't do that. Nice. But, but we had a consistent interface over, like, five chips in our family. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Um, our customers really liked it because they didn't have to re-implement everything for every new chip that came along. Yeah, they could get the chip up and running in the shortest period of time, and then uh, go from there. That's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, I spent ten years working on that chip. Oh wow, that chip family. <laughs> um, so, oh. I, I had a nice little software test lab that, when it started out, had about eight switches in it and a couple of servers. And when we finally dismantled it, it had 250 switches in it and 100 servers. Um, so it sounds like you're describing a data center is what you're describing. Well, yeah, it, it, it used the same amount of air conditioning as our data center did. <laughs> That's wild. So beyond writing, working on and expanding the uh, automation system that we had to do testing with, and working on the API, I also had to work with the facilities guys to build out the lab for me, the electrician contractors to build enough of power into that room, the AC guys to make sure that I had enough you running? cooling for it. Um, I had two big 400-amp um, pa three-phase panels. And what voltage? Feeding. Uh, 120. You know, okay. two, 208. 208 or 120? Well, 208 broke down, 208 three phase broke down as 120. Oh, I see. Okay. I was trying to do the math and figure out the wattage, but I forgot the current that you'd mentioned. 300 amp? 400 amp. 400 two amp. 400 amp panels at, say, 120 a leg. So it's 1200 amps, 120 twice. That's pretty So well. 2400 amps of 120 power in there. Okay, that's pretty wild. So 2,400 times 120. I should be able to do this math in my head, but this is embarrassing. Um, 24 kilowatts or 240 kilowatts? More than that, but I'm being approximate here. Um, you're looking at 240 kilowatts. Give 240 take a little yeah, okay. So like a little more than 240 kilowatts. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. <laughs> that's, I, I, you know, it was, a, it was a 20 by 20 room with a 20 ton air conditioner on it. Nice. <laughs> it was the biggest air conditioner on that building. That's pretty funny. I think about like, I don't know if you've seen those um, like multi kilowatt motors that Hobby King sells that are like that big. But that's yeah. kind of what I'm reminded of, where you've got something where the wattage going into it just doesn't make sense for the size. So, you know, you need an air conditioning unit or a water cooler or something crazy like that just to make it work at all. Yeah, we had it. It, it was very useful to have, though, because I had people from Montreal, from um, Gdansk, Poland, um, Portland, Oregon, all of those using that equipment in that lab. Um, Just and remotely. a group from India at one point in time. Yes. That's cool. And they could go in and we could reserve equipment. We could kick off tests. We could tell it run, you know, one test. We could tell it to run 1,200, which is what our test suite was composed of. 
Um, it dumped everything into a database for us so you could go back afterward and do analysis of what worked and was what didn't. Was that co-located or was the database and the data center like separate? The database and everything was in a data center. Nice. Okay, that's what you should be doing it. That's awesome. Separate from the lab. Um, the uh, Actually, most of the development tools that we used and everything were hosted in the data center. That's awesome. And the uh, lab was strictly for test equipment. That sounds like a lot of fun. Like that it just seems like an awesome it, way to do it. It actually was a lot of fun setting up and building all of that out and maintaining it. Nice. I, I got invited to a facility recently, which had the biggest power utility I ever saw, which is one of the reasons I asked. It was three megawatts. And on their roof, they had 200 kilowatts of solar. And then they had a uh, natural gas generator in front of the building. And then they had um, like a giant external battery bank that was like maybe the size of like a couple of tractor trailers as well. And so it was that was an interesting thing to see because I I'd never seen something with that kind of power scale in one place. And I guess it was sort of cleverly designed because they were um, sort of balancing power between all the stuff. So I guess if you looked at like peak power utilization times, that's when they kick on the natural gas generator and it was cheaper to run that than it was to get power from the grid at certain times of day. But then it made more financial sense to get power from the grid at other times of day. So it was it's a really cleverly designed system. It's kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, we had the problem with ours that the landlord wouldn't let us have a generator. Oh, why not? Um, they thought it would be too unsightly to have the big thing sitting out there, even if we built walls around it or whatever, and wouldn't let us have it. So every now and then we'd lose power. Oh, uh, brutal. The UPS, the UPS that ran our data center could keep up a couple of machines for a while, but not the entire data center. <sighs> Makes sense. Um, we, we were a small site. We were only about 70 people. So yeah. we had a data center big enough for several hundred people because <laughs> we did the chip design there and we did the chip simulation there. Yeah. And, and the simulation required quite a bit of compute power to do. Usually does. Um, we were at one point building the largest chip that TSMC, the largest single die that TSMC was building. How do you simulate a chip? Because I have seen other types of simulation take up a lot of compute in data centers, but I guess I've not ever tried to simulate a chip designs. There are details. there are software tools that will take the output of the design, the, the design tools, the, the chip design tools that will allow you to simulate it, not at full speed, but at some slow rate. Are you simulating the are, fabrication of the chip or the chip's actual functioning? The chip's functionality. Okay, got it, got it, got it. And uh, what we did for our, our, our testing for the software side of it is we would do a, we started out with a register sync where you just had a bunch of fake registers in it and we could take the output from the chip design that would generate the list of all the registers we had and what their defaults were and everything else and we would just kind of work off of that that register sync where we could write into the register and read back from it oh, interesting. and fake a chip being there yeah and uh, over time we actually built up some tools that would allow us to take some of the design in because the design languages nowadays are programming languages just like anything else. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, we would take the design to, to the design in and actually run it as a simulation. Uh, oh, interesting. For, from a software point where we weren't running clocks, you know, clock synchronous register, uh, you know, clock synchronous design work, but we could do a simulation, a low speed simulation of it. Um, to prove out the design um, and to prove out our API so that when the chips physically showed up, we were ready to start testing them. That's cool. Yeah, I've never done anything on that scale. What kind of hardware did you have back ending that? Would the register sync have just been modeled in RAM or was it more of a physical approximation of, of what's actually going on with like something like a... Um, 
I don't know. I would think like an FPGA or something, but I, I don't know. In our case, we just simply used an array in software. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So that there was not, no external dependencies on for it at all. Uh -oh. So that probably did land in RAM, but by abstraction, so you can't really yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it would it would it would have been in RAM, but it was just like I said, it was just a structure in software. Neat. When I was still a student, um, we we did uh, like a model MIPS programmer, and that's the closest thing I've done to what you're describing. So that's my small frame of reference at a much smaller, dinky, or not as impressive scale. So <laughs> I uh, say my hats off to you, sir. I was just part of the team that did it. Nice. How did you get into the field of engineering? Like what, I guess, at what point in your life did you turn left and decide that that's what you wanted to do? And, and what iterations of engineer did you go through before you kind of landed on, on where you are today? So um, out of high school, I had no idea what I was doing. I went to a junior college and took all of the calculus and uh, chemistry and physics and stuff like that, because that was what was interesting to me, but I really didn't have any application for it at that point. And uh, I started dating the person who became my wife. And uh, her dad was an IBM software developer for IBM's federal system. So cool. And he was involved in a small startup. And they needed somebody to uh, start it out with just transport equipment around. So <laughs> I haul gear for them. At one point, I had a little, uh, a little Mazda that was like 10 or 15 years old that was just a little rattle trap That's that awesome. I'm carrying around about $30,000 worth of uh, in-circuit emulators in. Nice. I'm picturing an MX-5, yeah. but I don't know if that's what you're actually talking about. It was an RX-2. Nice. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and uh, he was, like I said, he was an IBM engineer. Well, IBM engineers never coded their own stuff because that was just after the, you know, as they're transitioning from card punch and they had people who were dedicated card punch people. So they'd write everything out on coding sheets and give it to typists to type in. That's a weird and way to do it. But I mean, I guess that's he, the time he, we were in. My, my now father-in-law um, was, couldn't type to save his life. <laughs> so he needed somebody to start entering code in for the stuff they were developing. They were building a small business system, which was going to have a word processor, an accounting system, and maybe a calendar in it. And this was before the IBM PC came out. This was, you know, the era of the Atari ST and that kind of stuff. That'd be the 80s? Yeah. Okay. Actually, the late 70s. Cool. And uh, he needed somebody to type in all this code that he was writing. So I went, okay, well, I can, I can, I can almost type. Um, <laughs> and so I started entering the code for him, and it was a lot of 8088 and uh, Z80 assembly language. Nice. And he showed me, okay, now once you've got the file typed in, you do this to it, and it, you know, it, it compiles it or assembles it. And then here's how to link it and turn it into the application. It's amazing that he knew how to do all that, but he didn't know how to type just by today's standards. Yeah. Yeah. And so I started typing it in, then I started running the assembler on it, and I would start finding where there were errors in it, and I'd go back through the code and start trying to figure out what it was doing. And uh, I started programming that way. That's awesome. I wonder, yeah. like, just because I've... This is new to me. So I, do you think there were any programmers in that era that weren't really good programmers and just relied on the, the data entry people to like code for them? Like there must have been, right? Like, I mean, if you're just passing off a theory and somebody else has to implement it and do all the debug, like there must have been a few people that were kind of getting by on the coattails of their, their reports. Well, in his now, case, like, in his case, they uh, turned it over to a typing pool. Yeah. And oh, so uh, you couldn't do that. Just typists that makes sense so because you just had randos you couldn't rely on some whiz kid to always get it right for you yeah that makes sense 
Um, and so I learned to program Z80 and 8085 assembly language that way. And nice. then um, they had someone doing an accounting system for them that did it in a custom built basic. And uh, he decided to leave the company um, and they said, well, it's not done. Um, there's still some bugs in it. Why don't you look at it and see what you can figure out? And uh, so I taught myself enough basic to fix some of the problems in it. Nice. And uh, then ended up going to school, taking a couple of programming classes. This would have been um, past the era of punch cards if you were in basic, I would think. Um, yeah, there were, okay, so. Because punch cards were after like four finishing, track, right? After Sorry. finishing some classes in school and stuff, I went and got a job with Grumman Aerospace. Oh, cool. Working on the uh, the the weapons control system for the F-14. Interesting. And uh, they were just in the process of converting from punch cards to terminals. Really interesting. And uh, so occasionally some of the things I had to do required using punch cards. Um, I got to do lots of stuff with nice reel-to-reel -reel tapes. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, we had a machine that we were doing our builds for the uh, weapon system on that were CDC computers um, from the 19, probably late 50s. Wild. Um, and uh, you just the, stuck the with build stuff because it's like somehow tested or well, how'd you end up with that? Um, that was the system that they were using to build the uh, 14 software on and the, the system in the F14. computers. The F-14 was yeah, using old computers for quite a while. Um, the Right after I left to, left working on it, they started a program to update the computer on it to something that was only 10 or 15 years old. <laughs> That's wild. I guess to be fair, like for space applications, people still do stuff like that. I mean, not, you know, 1950s tech, but like 1990s and 80s tech seems to Well, I mean, Psyche... Like Psyche and um, the, uh, which is the most recent Mars rover, um, was called Mars 2020, but they changed the name of it. Those are running power PCs. And those were, those are mid to late 90s tech, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's partially in the case of, of the, uh, you know, NASA's programs. It's because they've designed rad hardened versions of those chips that are sense. space rated now. And, you just and it's really hard. An i5 that is rad hardened. So people use power PCs. Yeah. 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 I'd rather have it not get taken out by radiation than have it be the fastest thing ever. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Spending so I, I came up mission. Through Sorry. Yeah. So I came up through working on the F-14. Then I worked for a company called Quarterdeck Office Systems um, doing uh, Windows for a PC very, very early on. Um, when you say Windows for a PC, you mean you were writing like a custom Windows build or you were doing something different? It was before Microsoft had released Windows. Oh, but it was still called Windows. We had, it was called Desk View was the name of our product. Got it. And uh, we could do, you know, some of the early software in Windows on a piece, on an 8088 type PC, 286, 386 PC, um, a couple of years before Microsoft ever released their Windows stuff. That's interesting. Did any of your IP end up getting acquired by Microsoft from that? Um, no, it didn't. Um, it was actually the group that started it was a bunch of people who came out of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Group. Oh, interesting. So in a roundabout way, it kind of made its way, or maybe it was derivative of the same tech that made its way over to Apple, at the very least, because I know they yes. got the idea for the mouse from there. Yeah, and, you know, because Xerox is actually the one that owns the patents to Windows. I did not know that. Yeah. When uh, Microsoft, still around, I guess Apple, Park is still around. So yeah, that makes sense. When when Microsoft and Apple were were going at each other's throats, suing each other over all the Windows stuff and everything, it stopped suddenly when uh, when uh, Digital Research held out their 
or Xerox held out their uh, <laughs> patent and went, guys, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, my, my understanding was that Apple like was all but given the idea and the IP for the mouse by Park because Xerox HQ decided they didn't have an interest in it. And then Apple basically yeah. just got it for almost free. And then I, I guess Microsoft acquired it a similar way. Um, yeah, I don't know how they ended up with it. I know that um, Quarterdeck, we had the uh, the chief architect from Palo Alto Research Group working as the uh, CTO for uh, Quarterdeck. Nice. Well, that's pretty cool. So that was that, that was an interesting group to work thing. on. What it would was, this have been like the this probably was the eighties then, like the late eighties, I would think, if I had to place it from yeah, what you're describing. Mid mid eighties. Interesting. That's wild. How'd you how'd you find out I mean how how do you get involved with that group? Like how do how do you uh what was your what was your foot in the door? How did you uh find yourself with that crew? I somehow had a recruiter find me. Nice. I, I don't even know in the eighties how that worked. Yeah, there wasn't LinkedIn. I mean, that's, you know, that's been a game changer. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder. Um, I, I don't know exactly how he found me. I still remember his name. His name was Tony Rich. Nice. And uh, he called me up out of the blue one day and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in this? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's a really cool part of history to have been involved in uh, at that kind of a level. I'm, I'm kind of jealous, actually. It's, I don't know. I probably came online in the in the late '90s, just in terms of like my ability to comprehend this stuff, and then I didn't start doing anything professionally until like the early 2000s. And at that point, I was only an IT person. Um, and then I, I got my first engineering job in like I don't know, like the 2010s so much much later <laughs> so. yeah i started in i started down the dark path in the uh in the 80s early 80s that's awesome and, uh, have been doing software ever since that's really really cool and i feel like firmware is the best kind of software so i mean obviously i'm biased as a hardware nerd but i i think it's cooler than the than the high level stuff just because I don't know. Like when I was a student, I always loved um, the architectures courses uh, for like systems architecture and processor design. And the firmware stuff was always interesting to me. And assembly language was always interesting. And one of my friends explained it to me, um, starting with registers and just how things get moved around. And I don't know. For me, that was always kind of a fun puzzle and, and a thought exercise to get into. And I guess I never did it at the level you have professionally because, I mean, these days I'm, I'm really more of like a salesman and engineering manager type. But I don't know. I, I always admire people that could do that kind of stuff because it's, it's very near to my heart. <laughs> so that's, that's cool. I, I spent a lot of years doing assembly language. Um, lots of different projects that, uh, you know, were, were small and needed to be small and tight because the processors we were on were tiny. Um, I worked for uh, a company that was a division of Hayes, practical peripheral modems, um, doing modems on little tiny Intel microcontrollers, <laughs> trying to pack in everything we could into those little microcontrollers. Um, what were some of the tricks you used to, I mean, I, I guess I probably stayed away from recursion. I'm imagining, um, I'm imagining having to maybe load things into like various levels of cache and Ram in order to get away with like a smaller amount of registers. I'm just guessing here. I, I'm, I don't know. Cause I wasn't there. Well, primarily what, what I usually find is with a lot of the things that I do is the smaller you keep the code, the less, you know, the less you need to optimize the, you know, you do just the absolute minimum yeah. in any piece of code. Okay. So uh, you've got your functional requirements and as long as you can hit that, it don't be fancy, don't show off, don't add extra crap that you don't need. 
because all of yeah. that is going to kill your memory and then probably eventually, well, first of all, it'll kill your EEPROM because you won't have anywhere to put the code. And then after that, it'll start to kill your memory if you're doing stuff like recursion or like multiple nested. Oh, loops yeah. And crap like that. Yeah, you, you, you really can't do recursion in, a, in, in those little tiny microcontrollers because you don't really have that much stack space or anything else. Yeah, it makes sense. You overflow that stack pretty quick unless you've got like a compiler that undoes yeah. what you did, in which case like maybe you shouldn't have programmed it that way in the first place. Well, that's the fun part about assembly languages is you don't really have the tools to undo things for nice. you. <laughs> um, I worked on a, a Air Force contract with a company where I had been brought in to start adding, again, adding more functionality to a existing um, implementation. And the guy who they had in had spent the last three months rewriting almost the entire system because the thing kept crashing on him and he couldn't figure out why. And uh, I'm in there for my like my second week and I had written some code in it and I was going through the debugger and doing using a physical hardware debugging system, you know, in circuit emulator. And all of a sudden I keep seeing that I'm going into places I shouldn't be going into. Oh, interesting. And I traced it back to the fact that there was a interrupt service routine that wasn't saving one of the registers that was being used. Oh, so that was a and pointer, presumably, like maybe even a, a line pointer. It, it was an index pointer. Yeah, index pointer. In, sorry. It was being used as index into arrays, and it was just getting clobbered in the middle of this interrupt service routine. And uh, I fixed what he had spent three months working on in like two days. <laughs> That's a good find. Yeah. I When I used to code, which I, I haven't done in quite a while, admittedly, one of the things I found would help with something like that is sometimes if I was really stuck, I would print it all out and I would just start going through with a pen and writing, drawing arrows and tracing the locations of like a hypothetical data set that I would, I would imagine was going through the program. Do, do you ever do stuff like that or like how do you frame stuff like that i i have had my occasions where i've printed out big chunks of code and sat down and walked through it trying to figure out what it's doing because you can't always see everything on one screen amen to that and i found my memory is not even that good so that's why i have to start writing down you know like i i really for me working through an example um and again I, i've I've never done this at a super professional level. I, I got offered a job as a research programmer as an undergrad, and that's when I realized I didn't want to be a programmer. And so I really only did it for, you know, uh, about a summer. I was like, this probably isn't for me. But I, I finished out the computer science degree because I was already so far in. And so, um, but, um, yeah, that's that's when that method did, did good for me. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah, you know, we, we live, at least today, we live in a, basically a paperless environment. And uh, there are just times where you've got to print it out. Yeah, I still do it with contracts at work. Like I'll still, pretty much 100% of the time when I'm reading through a contract, I will print it out and I go through clause by clause. And as I'm reading, I'll check off the ones that seem inane and I put either a, a star or a circle around the ones that seem, I think the circles for like questionable and the stars for egregious. And then I've uh -huh. got, you know, certain notes I'll put in, like, does this mean what I think it means? And then in the other margin, I'll write, you know, and then I, I read through it a second time. Uh, and that time I only look at the start and the circle clauses. And then I type up my notes and then I send it to the opposing legal team. <laughs> Sometimes I run it through my own lawyers first just to make sure I'm not, you know, if there's something I don't understand or if it's just outside my knowledge as, you know, a pleb and not a real lawyer, you know. But I find that's the closest I really get these days. And maybe that in, like, systems engineering. So if I'm doing, like, a, um, a requirements document or, like, trying to architect the states and modes for a system, it's a really similar part of the brain that gets exercised. Uh -huh. So. It's just interesting how the same thought processes can 
apply to like a bunch of different sub disciplines or even different fields. And sorry if I'm kind of seeming no. abstract right now. I'm just kind of thinking about what you said and trying to apply it to you know how do I use this anymore. So this is this is fun to talk about. Yeah, you know, I I, I look at like. Well, I have a son who is uh, he's working for a company up in San Jose doing holographic displays. Oh, cool. And like it's not ghost or different. No, they're doing straight up. You look at it. It's holographic. Oh, wild. OK, I have no idea how that works yet. Um, it's it's a bunch of lenses and stuff, and it's all proprietary. And he can't even tell me what most of it is. So that's cool. But he is a amazing software engineer and he can look at stuff and remember stuff that he's got four pages above what he's looking at now that it was doing you know something and i can't do that anymore i i think at one point i could <laughs> but uh it just i it it amazes me to watch what he's doing that's um, cool he's he's doing a rendering engine for this thing that would probably make what most video game companies use look like a toy. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I mean, you know, I don't want to say kids these days, but like a lot of the new generation of engineers, like, I don't know if they realize, you know, how good they've got it with some of the technology that's out anymore. Cause like, I mean, the state of GPU tech, for instance, is like, you could never do even like 10 years ago, like some of the stuff that I'm sure is the enabling technology for what your son is up to. I mean, oh, yeah. just the hardware didn't exist. And so it's, it's really cool to see. I mean, I remember the first time I saw like a graphics card that didn't have, a, you know, any kind of display output on it and just being used for simulations. And I mean, I thought that was smoking cool and like pretty interesting. Yeah, his his little display uses a bank of uh, the highest uh, NVIDIA graphics cards. <laughs> nice. Um, a lot of them. I figured it might. <laughs> so it's... Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, when you're doing stuff like that, that's that's the technology that, that you need uh, to, to make it even work. So. Yeah, and, and he's taught himself graphics programming all on his own. Nice. Um, his uh, his graphics classes he took in college, um, he knew the instructors, and they would refer things to him. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and he self-taught for most of that, uh, a lot the same way that I learned what I do. Yeah, that was that was one of my favorite things about school was we had um, that making a simulated MIPS processor assignment I told you about. Um, I remember I was taking. Um, what was the class? It was uh, it was like a basic um, architecture class. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was like intro to you know processor architecture or something like that. And mm -hmm. everybody else in the class needed to go to a lab and basically be walked through that assignment. But I think I did it like four weeks early and just handed it in. And you know, as a result, my processor that I made up looked totally different than everyone else's. Like, I think mine was a lot more, um, it was a lot of smaller modules that were more distributed and everyone else's was like kind of more, you know, matrices of gates. And so uh -huh. it was, I don't know, it, it was, it was a fun assignment. I really enjoyed trying to get my head around that. And there was a joy in, in figuring out before anyone else. So I can relate. <laughs> so. Yeah. For, for me, you know, the education part of my background is very, very minimal. Um, I, uh, I, because of some family issues, missed my bachelor's degree by two classes. Brutal. And uh, um, so I don't have a lot of educational experience. Doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, you've got the experience, clearly. <laughs> e everything that I've done, I've learned on the job, you know. Um, I learned robotics by working on a project that was ROS based. Nice. Uh, I, uh, you know, so you're pretty recent I, into I, robotics then, if that's the case. Yeah. Like I venture to say, even though you've been an engineer much longer than me, I may have been working on robots longer than you. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. 
That's that's interesting. Um, robotics is something that I've just gotten into recently, and it is just too cool. Yeah, for sure. I agree. <laughs> I completely agree. Um, yeah. I, I knew I wanted to do it. I, I think I was like between 7 and 12 years old, and I had a cousin who was a professor in uh, the Carnegie Mellon National Robotics Engineering Center. And he brought okay. me through there and showed me... Um, I don't know who made it, but there was a robot arm that was painting it. Well, I guess there were like some drilling operations and then there was a painting operation and it was just this metal plate that got machined and painted as it went through this work cell. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, it would have been like the mid nineties. And I just, at that moment I knew that's, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> it's like, so I, I sort of chased that dragon ever since and, and, tried a lot of different entry points like I, I tried the software side and i tried the mechanical side and i tried the electrical side and these days what i do is kind of a combination but yeah i, I love it so much what was your first robotics project okay so the flying robot was one of them no, that's a uh, deep end throw if i've ever heard one you did figure out about physics like i mean like whenever i meet somebody that's always done software and they're doing robots for the first time I'm not saying this was you, but I'm saying like nine times out of 10, like a pure software engineer that I've known that's gotten thrown into a robotics project has tried to code the physics of the robotics project like it was a game of Pong. And it sounds like, I mean, you mentioned being really good at physics in junior college, so I'm sure you, you probably had that knocked out already, but that's just, that's quite a deep end throw. So you must've figured well, out really, it was really quick. <laughs> It, it was really nice because the guy who was the head of the program is a PhD in mechanical engineering and physics. And so I could make use of him for everything nice. I needed in it. I just had to do the implementation side of it. That's awesome. And, you know, the kinematics and all of that, he could work out real easily. Nice. Uh, we, we had a filming day one time where we had a film crew out there with like four cameras and all of that. It's it's what ended up in some of the YouTube videos of that robot. Yeah, I remember watching them. They're cool. And we broke the robot. As and, we do. <laughs> uh, it had, it had uh, sacrificial parts in it that would break if, if we stressed them too much to save the servos and everything. And Nice. So about halfway through the filming session, we broke him. We put him on the gurney and rolled him into the uh, workshop that we had, and we're sitting there Did taking him apart. <laughs> That's cool. And yeah, we use gurneys. Nice. Um, the uh, the director, I think, uh, the, for the filming side of it, comes in and goes, "Is is he going to be okay? Is the robot going to be okay?" And I turn to him, absolutely deadpan, and I go, "Oh, it's going to be fine. He's a doctor." <laughs> He had a PhD in mechanical engineering, but he's still got his doctorate. Yeah, he's the, so he's the closest he got. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but we're sitting there unscrewing this humanoid robot. Yep. And so it just fit perfectly. That's nice. <laughs> and after we stopped laughing over that, we managed to get him fixed and back together. How long did that take? Because I feel like it's always a few hours in my experience. It was about an hour and a half. Oh, it's quick. <laughs> Mostly because we had tons of screws in it. We broke a knee joint. So you had to dive. Okay, that makes sense. So you had to go in and extract all those screws. We had to extract all the screws out of it, disassemble the the leg, and uh, put in a new uh, sacrificial part. Yeah, I mean it's still impressive that you were able to do it as quick as an hour and a half. Um, a lot of times in my experience, those early stage projects are not that optimized for service. I'll say. So that sounds like you probably well, had some smart folks on the team that, that thought about that when you were designing it. The, the, the mechanical engineers that did the design for it did an excellent job on it, although it was still not easy to take apart. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I mean, the first time I ran my software on it, on the new board that we had for it and everything else, um, it launched and he just floated in air and crashed into the catch net at the end and folded in half. <laughs> I'm guessing you had one of those sacrificial joints go out when it folded. At least one. Nice. Maybe more. <laughs> Was and everybody like looked shirt? at it and went, everybody looked at it and went, oh, okay, so you broke it. We've done it before. Nice. 
And uh, it turned out it was part of the uh, timing. It was it was sensing the um, start command multiple times. Oh, interesting. So it, it reset while it was in the air and then tried to do the honing and that's how it crashed? Um, no, it actually never, there, there was a, a, as we did the launch, we had this like three second hold that we did at the beginning, right before it let go of it. And uh, as the feet were letting go, the contacts kind of broke and remade. Ah. We got noise on the contact line and it said, oh, we're starting. No. It said, okay, we're starting. We wait three seconds, then we launch. And it said, we're starting. Then we got noise on the line, which I interpreted as we're starting and reset the three second counter. But the winch and didn't three reset. three seconds was roughly the flight time of it. <laughs> so he just laid there limp flying through the air. Ah, rough. Yeah, maybe, maybe the answer there is to have some kind of a better handshake between the winch and the robot. That... Uh, we got it. We got it worked out a lot better. Nice. Um, in the next in the next generations of stuff, we changed out the interfaces that we had, um, and uh, got it, it and uh, and robustness in the software to handle that too, so that we didn't restart a second time, and we got rid of the three second timeout because that was partially for dramatics for the videos. Makes sense. So did you? just introduce it manually then so you start it you know like right before you use it but you would just wait three seconds to hit start um no um what we did is like i said we took out the three seconds because one of the earlier versions of the robot the servo that held the head would overheat if it had to hold the head up for any length of time oh, it no. was too small. <laughs> so they just left the head down until they hit the start command. And part of that three second was this very dramatic lifting of the head facing the direction it was going to fly. And it looked so good on camera that we just left it in. Nice. Right up until we got it ready for going into the park, we removed all of that. So the timing was when we issue the start command, we're actually going to move. Nice. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because nobody sees it in that first position when it flies out, so right. it doesn't matter. Yeah, and we had a bigger servo, so we pulled the head up immediately as part of the the positioning for the start position. That's kind of amazing that you did that because you didn't want to overload the servo, but the effect was that it looked good on camera. That's, yeah. That's a pretty good result. <laughs> it's a feature. Yeah, it was fun. Nice. Yeah, it sounds like a blast. How long did it take to turn that project around, like approximately... So they were about a year into it when I got there, and we spent about another year on it. Nice. That's awesome. So, so yeah, it was about two, two and a half years from, uh, from the initial, if you watch the videos, they were throwing a two by four with some pneumatics on it to, uh, to they made a miniature version of it, half-sized, but they called it Mini Man. <laughs> um, and they were doing that indoors until they wrapped it around the uh, fire sprinkler pipe. <laughs> and, uh, the safety people and everybody said, um, no, we're not doing that anymore. You need to move outside. And about that same time, they got the first of the uh, full-size um, robots. Yeah, I would imagine with, like, windage, you probably want to have that just to, I don't know, I mean, counteract we did, that more. That we did a lot of analysis of it to find out what kind of wind conditions it can be used in um, because we can't overthrow in the park. Um, because there's people around. There's people around the building, and we had to prove to them that it was never going to miss the catch net. And if it did, here is where it would land. Was that building that it hit like projected at that point? I'm guessing that's why it breaks away. Um, yes, that is the catch nets just the other side of that wall. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. So that's that's nearly a on target. Yeah, that uh, that whole thing. Um, there are actually a bunch of antennas on the roof of the building just past the catch net, and the idea is is if he overshoots, he'll get tangled up in those. Wait, is that what they're designed for? Like, so they're just not real antennas, or they're not real antennas. They're just nice. there as part of the decor. But the idea is, is if he ever overshoots the net, he gets caught in that because there could be people beyond that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
better to have a YouTube video or something out than to actually injure somebody. And you know, oh yeah, I mean, there's obviously we, ethical, we had uh, we had feet on the movable feet on the early versions of it. And part of the idea was, well, what happens if a foot disconnects uh, in midair? Where is it going to go? Well, it has a much higher possibility of going somewhere out of the normal plane of flight that the robot's going to have than the main body of the robot. So we designed the feet out. They're just fixed now. Oh, that's interesting. That makes sense. Um, so there's one less piece to have come undone. That's really interesting. Did you work with the safety engineering team directly on that? Or was that like a separate team and you just kind of saw the results? Um, they were part of the team. Cool. Do you remember like how they did those analyses at all? Like I, I've been sort of working with some of those guys lately and it's been interesting to see them work. Like I guess there's a hazards and risk assessment tool that the guys I'm working with seem to like. And yeah, we did we did a lot of sim math lab simulations of what would happen to the robot um, in various different, uh, you know, different uh, events and, uh, you know, with the building in the in the involved in the simulation and, you know, what wind resistance in what poses and oh, cool. uh, so there were lots of tools, lots of stuff done with those tools. Um, yeah, it's amazing, like, you know, at that scale of project and with that level of funding, just the level of, you know, formal engineering that can be done around, you know, what might go wrong and how do we address it? I, I don't know. Well, you know, I, I, I always, I've had this idea since I worked at Disney that, you know, when Disney has something go wrong, um, it makes international news <laughs> for sure when universal has something go wrong it might make local news oh interesting i never even thought about that and disney is very image conscious so <laughs> that safety is extremely important to them yeah i guess that makes sense yes yeah, so they don't all right yeah that makes a lot of sense I um I have a buddy at Pratt Whitney who told me about the um what does he call it the newspaper test. So the newspaper test is apparently um you know what would it look like if this was on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow? <laughs> and, yeah. You know, so you think about that when making certain engineering decisions. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, we, Disney has to do the same thing. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that's uh it seems like a fun job though like I, I mean i don't know i would imagine like were there any other cool projects that you were working around while you were there that you saw kind of going on that you know i don't know i haven't been following disney a whole lot lately so it's interesting to hear about this stuff um so they have uh the facility that was one of the buildings i was in that uh basically there's whole sections of the building that are curtained off with black curtains and uh, limited access into them where all of their top secret projects are going on. <laughs> um, and uh, That's where they've got the every year real life Mickey Mouse. Yeah, we have him too. Um, <laughs> no, they, they yearly have an event they call the R&D Open House where the research and development group puts on an open house for mostly executives and stuff. Um, I was not directly part of research and development. I was actually in the, uh, what they called the tech studios group, which has, does mostly the animatronics cool. um, and stuff like that. And uh, then there's another group in, that's parallel to them that does all the ride software engineering. Um, and then um, R&D is a separate group also under that same kind of uh, upper management structure. And uh, I was fortunate enough because of the people I knew to get a to, to get to go on the uh, the R&D uh, open house tour. Nice. And uh, see, um, they just had the Hulk come out a, a couple of months ago where he's uh it's a giant um exoskeleton oh that's interesting i didn't know they did that 
and he was only out for a couple of months. Um, you'll find videos of the walking baby Groot. Um, I actually did a little bit of the, uh, I, I worked a little bit with the guy who did the um, motion control for it. No, right, that's tricky. Um, basically helping him do the, uh, uh, the uh, servo controls for it. That's awesome. So you were probably doing like implementation of math that that person would work out, I would think. No, right? actually, what oh, I was okay. doing was even lower than that. It was the 485 network that runs the servos. Nice. The direct servo communication stuff. Yeah, 485 is a great protocol. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, and uh, um, other things I was working on, you can find there's a YouTube video for a um, uh, animatronic called Jake. And he is supposed to be a fully autonomous robot that I they plan to have. They plan to have a number of them running around Star Wars land. And uh, I was working on the second generation of Jake. Nice. Was that teleoperated at one point or am I thinking of something else? Um, he had a back end control for him. He was supposed to be fully autonomous. Um, I don't know how fully autonomous the Jake prototype was. Um, I know the one that we were working on was we, we were going to do everything and just report what we were doing back to the back end system. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I might be thinking of something else then because I saw something with like a like a cute person name, but it was definitely fully teleoperated. There was like a duplicate of the kinematic chain that a human operator was moving and then it was... I think it was either pneumatic or hydraulic, so totally different thing. I'm just thinking of something different that someone Disney Research showed me. Yeah, there there's been a number of those. Um, they're they're doing work. They they use it in the Spider Man ride with like Open CV to uh, you know do body positioning. Oh, cool. Um, the Spider Man um, the Spider Man attraction that they have there that you ride in is a uh, like a shooting calorie type game only you don't use guns you're supposed to be like spider-man shooting webs <laughs> and it uses cameras to figure out all the poses and everything oh so doing. you just go in or, and it's doing you uh, don't have anything on tracking. you yeah it does all of the the object tracking of your arms and then you're probably I'm guessing maybe like 3d glasses and then you've got yeah okay yeah that makes sense yeah, and there's like eight or ten, I think there's ten CPUs. There's eight people in each car, and each person has his own basically dedicated PC handling the uh, the um, positional sensing. Interesting. And then there's one or two of them that does the communications to the back end to generate the graphics on it. So is it like a collaborative game where you're all trying to like fight the same bad guys, as it were? Or, or yep. do you have any? Okay, okay, that makes sense. You have four in a group, two, four on either side of the car, yeah. and then they have the 3D screens on either side of that, Yeah. on either side of the track. And you play on, your group plays on one side, the other group plays on the other. That's interesting. And, they, and then they have the program set up such that they're staggered in a way where you can utilize the same gimbal. Yeah. Well, it's a moving track. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. So if there's 3D screens, that means there's a bunch of them at all aspects of the track um there's multiple stations within the the attraction where oh i see so there's physical props something. you stop there's a station with screens and then there's yeah. more physical props while you're moving yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense cool we we got approached um eh, maybe like a year ago we didn't get the bid on this job by the way but it was interesting it was somebody that wanted to do a fully um I think it was, I can't remember if it was mixed reality or virtual reality, but they wanted to have a concert where like every single person could have a perfect seat. So the idea was like a concert in the round, but you get it from the same angle and everybody's wearing like headgear. And um, it, it was an interesting concept. Um, just starting to look into it from a discovery perspective, like the computational requirements were, were pretty insane. Like, I mean, we were looking at 
quite a bit of server infrastructure and just GPUs and, you know, I mean, I can't remember what the audience size was, but it wasn't nothing. And so it was, it was pretty interesting to try to work yeah. that out. But, yeah, uh, just trying to keep everything up to date. Yeah, and, and to have like, you know, like 30 to 60 frames per second, you know. I mean, that's, that's a, a difficult thing to do, uh, especially when you're trying to figure out what your perspective is and where you're looking at the world and render the world, you know in accordance yeah. with that you know i mean it's you know I don't, I don't know i mean just starting to think about it you know it was it was wild how complicated it was i'm sure the technologies for that is gonna advance leaps and bounds over the next few years and i mean you know it's all stuff like this that pushes it forward yeah um, it's the kind of stuff my son would just absolutely love getting in the middle of nice <laughs> that's awesome you know, he's he's sinking right now the whole bank of um, NVIDIA cards for the uh, 3D displays that he's doing from one single viewpoint. Uh, he's He's got to sync them because they're all displaying on different parts of a single display. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. So it's just high enough resolution or enough points... Well, I guess if you're rendering in 3D, because it's a hologram, like you have to do slices, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he knows how to do it. It's 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 beyond me. Um, you know, um, a lot of, he sits there telling me about some of it, and it just kind of goes like this. You know? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm lower level than that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a bit higher level um, to be able to do that sort of stuff. I always get impressed with the video game guys. Like the video game guys are actually like surprisingly good at robotics because they have a good understanding of linear algebra and then also just um, I don't know like how to work with GPUs and and there's a few skills yeah. that I feel like overlap really nicely into both those worlds. I mean the the consequences for fucking up I would say are higher in robotics than they are in the video game world. And so just I think that what's that? Just a little. Yeah, and so the biggest difference I've noticed being around video game developers and roboticists, I think, is like the standard of quality that people seem to build to, where like a roboticist will be content with a reduced feature set that runs robustly. A video game designer seems to want an expanded feature set that might be buggy, but like more more stuff. And so that, that yeah. seems to be... Well, and then obviously you're working in the digital world versus the physical world, but that, I don't know, there's, it's interesting to kind of see, I mean, and this gets back to like, you know, legal documents versus systems engineering versus code tracing, you know, how like similar ways of thinking can translate across disciplines. Yeah. So, maybe that's the theme uh, that we write into the description for this episode. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I, I feel like we're we're probably at a pretty good stopping point. We've gone for about an hour and a half. Um, is there anything that you want to maybe leave people with or, or plug uh, on the on the tail end of this podcast? Um, no, I think we've done a good job of covering stuff randomly, but there wasn't any linear path in all of that. No, there never is, and it's. It's a little bit intentional because I, I kind of enjoy um, just learning about people and where they're coming from and then drilling into tangents. But, I mean, I would definitely love to do this again sometime. I feel like, uh, you know, I, I had a great we, time. We could, do, we could do a whole other one and never touch the subjects. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I'm going to cut it. Thanks for coming on, Joe. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Spencer.